Coming up on Network Africa. France to close its embassy in Niger after a row with military government in power. Foreign ministers of Egypt and Britain stress the importance of protecting the Red Sea corridors. Plus, Ghana legalizes the cannabis cultivation for medical and industrial purposes. And welcome to the program today. I'm Layo Olarinde. As tensions between France and Niger escalates, France has announced it is closing its embassy in the country indefinitely. Explaining this, the French embassy said it's no longer able to function or fulfill its mission due to restrictions imposed by Niger's military government. Niger's relationship with France has soured since the military ousted democratically elected President Mohamed Bazoum in a coup in July this year. The former French ambassador Sylvain Ite also noted that local embassy staff have been dismissed as the consulate came under attacks by thousands of the ruling Junta supporters who called for withdrawal of French troops from Niger's soil. In the meantime, Malian ambassador to Algeria has been summoned to the Algerian Ministry of Foreign Affairs on, uh, to discuss the latest developments in the situation in the sub-Saharan country. Well, this is coming a day after Bamako summoned the Algerian ambassador to Mali. On Wednesday, the Algerian ambassador on Bamako was called upon by the Malian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Algiers is accused of holding meetings with Tuareg separatists with, without involving the Malian authorities. However, Algeria has argued that recent meetings with the leaders of the signatory movements of the Peace and Reconciliation Agreement in Mali resulting from the Algiers process was for peaceful purpose. Well, Algeria shares around 1,400 kilometers of borders with its southern neighbor, Mali, a poor land locked country in the heart of the Sahel, was rocked by two military coups in August 2020 and May 2021. Well, this political crisis goes hand in hand with a serious security crisis that has been underway since 2012 and also the outbreak of independence and jihadist insurgencies in the northern region. Here in Nigeria is just days to the end of the year and the deadline set by the federal government of Nigeria, rehabilitation work on the Port Akut refinery has reached a major milestone with what the NNPCL describes as the mechanical completion of the first phase of the project. Well, during an inspection tour of the refinery, the group managing director of the Nigeria National Petroleum Company Limited, Mr. Mele Kiari, says this is in keeping with the timeline to complete the project by the end of December. The Minister of State for Petroleum Oil, Heineken Lokoberi, who briefed the media on the development, says it represents a major landmark in the country's quest for self-sufficiency in petroleum products, as well as becoming a net exporter of fuel. All of us had to be you know, on top of our, you know, our games, so that today becomes a reality. The mechanical part is completed, and this is the beginning of, you know, the completion of not just this particular refinery, you know, phase one and two, but the one for Wari and then the one in Karuna, so that we'll be able to benefit from this massive investment that the country has made. I'm really impressed, and it is uh, good news equally to LPG users, that as the refinery commences after Christmas, we'll have a sufficient uh, supply of uh, LPG, which will automatically reduce the import at that level. So it is something to celebrate. I know the joy that is in the hearts of Nigerians with the coming up on stream of this uh, first one. Others will follow suit because they have fulfilled the first assignment and I believe others will be completed on schedule. 
Meanwhile, Nigerians have been asked to be cautiously optimistic about the Port Harcourt refinery, where the first phase of rehabilitation, which covers the mechanical, has just been concluded. An oil and gas expert, Mr. Nick Agule, who was a guest on our Business Morning program, warns that since the capacity of the facility is 60,000 barrels, the impact will hardly be felt. Mr. Agule also draws attention to when production could begin at the refinery. It's going to take a bit of time from this announcement to when the first commercial production will come off the refinery in Port Harcourt. So, uh, yes, Nigerians should have high hopes, but we shouldn't expect to be buying petrol from Port Harcourt refinery in the next few months. But if there are any issues coming up from the testing, perhaps not envisaged, and all of that, then it's going to take longer until everything is in place, working perfectly in sync before the first uh, oil, I mean, the first products will come off that refinery. So first quarter, second quarter, it could be longer. Our prayer should be that. It should be the shortest possible time, first quarter. I would also like to tell Nigerians that our optimism, we should manage our optimism because this Port Harcourt refinery, there are actually two refineries in Port Harcourt. And this one that has been rehabilitated is the smallest of them. It's 60,000 barrels per day refinery. And it was uh, constructed even before I was born in 1965. It's an old refinery. Uh, the age is said doesn't matter if it was being maintained very well over time. But I don't think it was being maintained like that over time. So it's not a big uh, refinery. And the impact on the overall consumption of uh, petroleum products in Nigeria is not going to be that much. The UN Security Council has unanimously adopted a resolution 2719 on the financing of the African Union-led peace support operations, which was authored by Gabon, Ghana and Mozambique. Well, speaking after the vote, Michel Xavier, uh, Gabonese Gabonese ambassador to the UN, said every time the council meets, it shows that it is a rampant and deterrent against war and it revives hope for future generations. Also addressing the council, Ambassador of Mozambique to the UN said the framework resolution would translate objectives to address the concerns to address the concerns of Africa that have been pending for years. Uh, for his part, U.S. diplomat Robert A. Wood emphasized that these operations must include appropriate safeguards for the protection of civilians. The framework resolution just adopted translate is our objective to address the concerns of Africa that have been pending for many years. At its core is the need to give appropriate responses to the growing and evolving security challenges on the African continent. Challenges that uh, comprise conflicts, insurgency, progressive Africanization of terrorism and the proliferation of extremist armed groups. As we look to the future, we want to take a moment to highlight a few key elements of this resolution. First, it underscores the primacy of politics and the need for a coherent political strategy to guide any operation. Second, it notes that any support to AU PSOs must be in full compliance with the UN's human rights due diligence policy. Third, it emphasizes that these operations must include appropriate safeguards for the protection of civilians. And fourth, it outlines that any PSO receiving UN assessed contributions will be authorized by and ultimately accountable to this council for implementation of its mandate and to the GA for appropriate and reasonable use of funds. <coughs> Egypt is working with regional and global partners to ensure the freedom of navigation in the Red Sea area. Egyptian Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri made this known in Cairo, stressing that countries on the Red Sea itself all had a responsibility to protect it. Well, he was speaking alongside his British counterpart, David Cameron, who says it is essential to protect maritime trade corridors in the Red Sea amid the ongoing conflict in Gaza. 
According to Mr. Cameron, it would be damaging to Egypt, the UK, and also global trade as a whole should, attack, uh, should attacks by Yemen's Iran-backed Houthi militants continue on shipping lanes in the Red Sea. Done must be done to get aid into Gaza to help people in the desperate situation that they're in. And on that level, we've been talking about the United Nations Security Council resolution, um, where we are very keen to see consensus um, arrived at so that uh, Security Council resolution, which is really all about aid and the delivery of aid and the need to upscale the aid and the need for it to get through in far bigger numbers, that, that can go through. Talks continue and Britain will do what it can to try and build that consensus um, in New York at the Security uh, Council. I think the most important aspect of that in the immediate term is this issue of aid and we are pushing very hard as i have done from day one in this job to make sure that um karam abu salam karam shalom is properly open open for trucks to go in with aid um to help people in gaza uh, yesterday i was in jordan where i saw the aid being loaded up that now is coming from jordan into the west bank into israel into Karim Shalom, and we need to see that grow. That is a good route for more aid, and it's vital that we, we see that succeed. Let me confirm Britain does support the two-state solution. Obviously, we have to ask ourselves how we're going to get from where we are today towards that solution. I think one of the first things to say is it's very important that things aren't done now that make it impossible. And so we've been very clear with Israel, there can be no permanent occupation of Gaza, no displacement of people from Gaza, no diminution of the size of the Palestinian territories. All of those things would be wrong, and we've made that very clear. Russia says it is ready to supply more grain to Tunisia. Moscow's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov said this during a visit to the North African country grappling with shortages fueled by drought. At a meeting with Tunisian President Kai Saeed in the capital Tunis, Mr. Lavrov said Russia's crop yields have been good for the second or third year in a row and it is willing to help Tunisia. Well, over the past four years, Tunisia has been plagued by drought, which dealt a major blow to its last grain season. The North African nation almost exclusively depends on imports for cereals and is in dire need for durum wheat, soft wheat and barley until spring 2024. Well, this summer, President Vladimir Putin announced that Russia was set to deliver grain for free to six African countries, Mali, Burkina Faso, the Central African Republic, Eritrea, Zimbabwe, and Somalia. And this is coming even as Moscow seeks to bolster its foothold on the continent. COVID-19 vaccine maker BioNTech says it aims to start production at its mRNA vaccine factory site in Rwanda in 2025. It's the first foreign company mRNA vaccine manufacturing site on the continent. Well, the German company's first modular factory elements based on shipping containers were delivered to the Kigali construction site in March and then assembled into uh, so-called biotainers. BioNTech has reiterated that the biotainers could make other mRNA vaccines depending on product development, progress and also uh, public health priorities. Well, for the host country, President Paul Kagame says this would allow Africa not to be in a position of not having vaccines for the continent anymore. Africa will have one of the most advanced manufacturing facilities in the world. These biotainers will be able to manufacture any kind of mRNA vaccines. In 2025, we expect to manufacture test batches for regulatory approval, which could become the first commercial batches of mRNA-based vaccines and manufactured and delivered in Africa. Vaccine inequity hit Africa hard during the pandemic. We found ourselves knocking on every door in search of doses. 
the situation was intolerable. And the African Union came together to make a firm commitment that we would not allow ourselves to be in that position ever again. Welcome back to the program. The second of two political party forums on inclusive governance in South Sudan has concluded in the nation's capital, Juba. It's a collaborative workshop with the Office of the Vice President for Gender and Youth, the African Union, uh, the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, IGAD, and also the United Nations Mission in the country. The forum focuses on the participation of women in political processes to get a voluntary code of conduct from the parties on how they will behave in an electoral process. One of the leading concerns presented was the lack of civic education among the women in the country, and this was discussed by a broad cross-section of women in the South Sudanese society who attended the workshop. Or many believe this is one of the main reasons women are not taking their place in the country's leadership. Don't take this one as a small workshop. Those who are in this room, you are an ambassador for those sisters of yours who have not come here. You have to inform them about this workshop. You have to inform them about what is coming. I know there are a lot of hurdles who are there, but we women can overcome them. We are the mothers, we are the wives, we are the sisters. We have a lot of roles to play. We bring up children and you know I was hearing here before that women are 50%. No, in South Sudan we are 60% or even more. Young people, the youth, including girl child, are 73.6%. We are the biggest population. If we put our hands together and we do not want to vote for anybody, what will happen? We will win. With less than a year until the scheduled elections in December 2024, South Sudan stands at a critical juncture. Now is not the time for divisive party politics. It's a time for empathetic and inclusive leadership. The transitional government must ensure key institutions such as the National Elections Commission, the Political Parties Council, are adequately resourced, mandated and supported with the necessary political will to succeed in their mandated tasks. Ghana's parliament has marked a historic milestone by legalizing cannabis cultivation for medical and industrial purposes, aligning with the global momentum embracing the multifaceted benefits of cannabis. Well, this groundbreaking decision grants the Interior Minister the authority now to issue licenses, ushering in a transformative era in the country's cannabis regulations. Well, Ghana's commitment to realizing cannabis potential was underscored by the past of the Narcotics Control Commission Act 2020. Well, this move aligns with the global wave of countries harnessing the potential of the cannabis industry, which is estimated to be worth $30 billion in global GDP in January 2022. Licensing covers the entire spectrum of cannabis-related activities, including cultivation, processing, distribution, sale, import, and export. Let's kick off our Christmas stories back here in Nigeria. The Lagos State Government has asked residents to celebrate the Yuletide season with a spirit of love and share with others. This is according to the wife of the Lagos State Governor, Dr. Ibijoke Sonwolu, who represented the governor at the Christmas Carol held at Alausa Ikeja. She also urged Lagosians to continue to be law-abiding, be their brother's keeper, and promised more palliatives from the state government. <laughs> The colorful decoration at the Lagos House, Alausa Ikeja, makes it more obvious that it's the Christmas season. The annual event of the state's Christmas carol service is one occasion attended by top government officials, senior representatives of the Christian body, traditional rulers, invited guests, among others, 
all here to give thanks to God for the year 2023. The year 2024 will usher in more progress, dividends of democracy to all. While we are in celebration mode, so all the Christmas and New Year celebration, I wish to employ us all to keep safe and be our brother's keepers by extending love and the spirit of sharing to the less privileged. While we continue to uphold our dear country, Nigeria, in prayers, I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year in advance. It's a time to enjoy hymns, special performances by different groups, and of course, Thanksgiving. There are Bible readings by the Secretary to the State Government, Abimbola Salu Hudei, and the wife of the Deputy Governor of Lagos State, Oluremi Hamzat, focusing on the birth of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for the world. Do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sin. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. Standing in for the state governor is his wife, Dr. Ibijoke Sawolu, who urges residents to embrace the love of Jesus Christ and live in peace and harmony. As we celebrate Jesus Christ through spreading his love and hope for humanity, we must continue to preach togetherness and spreads the message of tolerance, peaceful coexistence, and harmonious relationships among people of diverse beliefs and backgrounds. We must also follow his teachings and actions, which exemplifies a righteous living as we strive to follow his footsteps. Let us remember that through faith in him, we can experience true righteousness and find hope and fulfillment in our lives. The Lagos State 2023 Christmas Carol is tagged King of Righteousness with a message to all residents to live in peace and harmony and be hopeful for a fruitful new year. And we have dazzling decorations light up Nairobi as Kenyans are celebrating the Christmas season. For many, 2023 has been a tough year and some residents in the country's capital say they are trying to make ends meet at a time when they would normally travel outside the city and spend time with friends and family. But this year, the Kenyan government imposed strict new tax laws, increasing the cost of living and also causing the citizens to feel deep pinch in their pockets. Adverse weather conditions struck the country also late November with El Nino flooding that killed about 120 people, forcing, th forcing thousands uh, of people out of their homes. However, many Kenyans are still determined to share the joy and warmth of the festive season. Traveling is uh, fun for me. So I'm looking forward to traveling, of course, and the festives that come along with the Christmas season. I'm also looking forward to the Christmas because, you know, it's a season where you meet uh, most of the people you haven't seen in the course of the year. On the other side, I'm still feeling a bit reluctant because the financial constraint, the economy is a bit, it's a bit high. So doing shopping, shopping, of course, you're wondering, where do you start? Um, of course, most of the things you could afford with this amount, uh, today you're doing it with a lot of money, and that makes budgeting quite uh, difficult. 
So that's a dilemma I'm having for this season, which makes it quite difficult to celebrate as I would want it. The, 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 low, the rains now, they have spoiled the roads, there are floods, and uh, that means communication is very difficult. And the economy again has affected it, so we can't buy much as we used to, even to give to relatives when you go home or something. Those, those are the issues I see in this Christmas as being very different from the previous Christmases. The plan for this year's Christmas is uh, wake up, make food in our pajamas, eat together, and of course give back to the community by donating some of what we have and sharing some of our food. Well, it's the weekend just before Christmas. Do have a joyous weekend. That's the end of Network Africa for today. I'm Layo Olarinde. Merry Christmas in advance.